Okay, so <clears throat> this is the beginning of the monsters lair. Okay, so Rothgar and his host are celebrating Beowulf's victory over the monster Grendel. But hey, did you know Grendel had a mother? Turns out uh, she does. She, yeah, she exists. And not only that, but Rothgar knew about her. And in some versions of this story of Beowulf, Rothgar and Monster Mommy were the co-creators of Grendel. Ew. So anyway, um, Grendel's mother kidnaps and kills Rothgar's closest friend and carries off the claw that Beowulf tore from her child. Kind of like... <gasps> That's my son's arm. There's no way you're going to hang it up there. Even monsters have a heart. The next day, the horrified king tells Beowulf about the two monsters and their underwater lair. Kind of like, okay, Beowulf, I'm kind of been holding out on you. There's a little bit more to this story. So, <clears throat> believe it or not, a monster like Grendel has a mother and she's very angry that Grendel got hurt, so she gets her revenge, and Rothgar does fill Beowulf in on some facts. He could have shared a little earlier, two monsters, and by the way, I also know where they live. They have this underwater lair, so when Rothgar didn't say anything when Beowulf was bragging, maybe it was because he's like, well, if this guy can take care of one monster, at least that's one monster away. And he didn't want to be forced to tell anything he didn't want to. Maybe. So here's Rothgar finally fessing up. I've heard that my people, peasants, working in the fields, have seen a pair of such fiends wandering in the moors and marshes. Giant monsters living in those desert lands. And they've said to my wise men that as well as they could see, one of the devils was a female creature. The other, they say, walked through the wilderness like a man, but mightier than any man. They were frightened and they fled, hoping to find help in Herat. They named the huge one Grendel. If he had a father, no one knew him. Of whether then there'd been others before these two, hidden evil before hidden evil. They live in secret places, windy cliffs, wolf dens, where water pours from the rocks, then runs underground, where mist streams like black clouds, and the groves of trees growing out over their lake are all covered with frozen spray, and wind down snake-like roots that reach as far as the water and help keep it dark. At night, that lake burns like a torch. No one knows its bottom. No wisdom reaches sub such depths. A deer hunted through the woods by a pack of hounds. A stag with great horns. Driven through the forest from faraway places. Prefers to die on those shores. Refuses to save its life in that water. It isn't far, nor is it a pleasant spot, when the wind stirs and storms, waves splash toward the sky, as dark as the air, as black as the rain, that the heavens weep, our only help again lies with you. Grendel's mother is hidden in her terrible home, in a place you've not seen. Seek it, if you dare. Save us once more, and again, twisted gold heaped up ancient treasure will reward you for the battle you win. So, anybody else a little confused? Back in the Wrath of Grendel, Grendel and the other monsters were descendants of Cain, the first murderer. Now there's nothing known about Grendel's ancestry or king. Why do we have this contradiction here? Oh, that's right. Multiple people might have told this story, and 
maybe they mixed it up and plus they're telling on different nights and well when they're storytelling there might be drinking and maybe they messed up some details because they weren't fully sober well, okay there's some possibilities there time to do your one sentence summary and we'll go on to this battle with grendel's mother what happens next Okay, so the battle with Grendel's mother here. Beowulf doesn't chicken out. He's like, ah, I could handle Grendel. I can handle the mother. He resolves to kill the lady monster. Arriving at the lake under which she lives, Beowulf and his companions see these serpents in the water. By the way, I just have to back up. Did you catch all that imagery and description in the monster's lair? Like, Rothgar can really tell a story. And do you ever see his superstitions come up? Like, he's talking about the mist and the black clouds and the storms and the darkness. And yeah, I don't think he believes in God very much. Anyway, back to Grendel's mother. Sorry. Um, Beowulf and his companions see these serpents in the water and then there's sea beasts on the rocks too yet. And so our hero Beowulf kills one of the beasts with an arrow and he's all right, ready to fight Grendel's mother here. Remember back when he was telling how he was related, he had said that he was Ed just those brave son. So here the cunning is Ed just those brave son. And uh, so there's lots of names for Beowulf, just like there were lots of names for Grendel. He can be the Geat's Proud Prince, the Geat's Brave Prince. Um, all of these different designations just help us to not have that repetition. Beowulf did this, Beowulf did that. It livens it up and reminds us of the history, which is very important. Who is related to who? Remember, Rothgar, <clears throat> oh knowing king, now, when my danger is near, the warm words we uttered, and if your enemy should end my life, then be, O generous prince, forever the father and protector of all whom I leave behind me here in your hands. My beloved comrades, left with no leader, their leader dead, and the precious gifts you gave me, my friends, send them to Higelok. May he see in their golden brightness the Geat's great lord gazing at your treasure, that here in Denmark I found a noble protector, a giver of rings whose rewards I won and briefly relished. Okay, giver of rings, that's referring to Rothgar, you know, like the person who pays for his death and his victory and kind of gives him gold for all this monster killing he's doing. Now, we get a reference to Unferth here. Unferth was a Danish warrior, and this is chopped out of our version, but Unferth had said, hey, Beowulf, are you really as brave as you're claiming here? I heard that you were in a race across the ocean, and this other guy came out ahead of you, and Beowulf's like, yeah, 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 okay, let me tell you why. The other guy beat me in the race, but I stopped and I killed monsters in the sea. And, and so they have this sort of battle of words. Unferth did not like Beowulf when he first arrived. And now Unferth has changed a little bit. And you're going to see him and how he comes to play in this. <clears throat> and you, Unferth, let my famous old sword stay in your hands. I shall shape glory with ranting, or death will hurry me from this earth. Okay, so another thing, Unferth had given Beowulf this special sword called ranting. Great name for a sword, huh? Ranting. And um, in, in return, Beowulf had given his sword to Unferth to hang on to. So basically he's saying, yeah, if I don't make it, just keep my sword. Well, I would think so. What's Beowulf going to do with it? He's dead. Okay. As his words ended, he leaped into the lake, would not wait for anyone's answer. The heaving water covered him over. For hours, he sank through the waves. How long can you hold your breath? For hours? 
Hmm, hyperbole, showing his heroic qualities. Let's see if I skipped over anything. I talked about the Kenning. Um, that one was for Rothgar and Beowulf. Took hours to sink to the bottom of the lake. In the original version, it even said it took him almost a day to sink to the bottom. So this exaggeration just makes him look more macho, more powerful. Okay, at last. Oh, hey, I think I'm finally getting there. He saw the mud of the bottom and all at once the greedy she-wolf. Canning. She-wolf? It's got to be Grendel's mama. Who'd ruled those waters for half a hundred years. Okay, so this mama is 50 years old. Discovered him. Saw that a creature from above had come to explore the bottom of her wet world. Ooh, good alliteration. She welcomed him in her claws. Clutched at him savagely, but could not harm him. Tried to work her fingers through the tight ring-woven mail on his breast, but tore and scratched in vain. She can't hurt him. Then she carried him armor and sword and all. Eh, well, I'll just take you to my lair. <laughs> to her home, he struggled to free his weapon and failed. Uh-oh, is Beowulf going to die? The fight brought other monsters swimming to see her catch. A host of sea beasts who beat at his male shirt, stabbing with tusks and teeth as they followed along. Wait a second, Beowulf is being attacked by all these sea monsters as he be he's being carried along by Grendel's mother? Then he realized the he here, that's Beowulf. Suddenly that she brought him into someone's battle hall. An underwater battle hall? Okay. And there the water's heat could not hurt him. Oh, wait, wait, it's like... A bubble? An underwater battle hall in a bubble. Nor anything in the lake attack him through the building's high arching roof. A brilliant light burned all around him, the lake itself like a fiery flame. Sounds kind of magical. Then he saw the mighty water witch and swung his sword, his ring-marked blade, straight at her head. The iron sang its fierce song, sing Beowulf's strength. But her guest, that's a kenning. Who's the guest? Beowulf. But her guest discovered that no sword could slice her evil skin, that hunting could not hurt her was useless now when he needed it. Oh no, even the magical sword doesn't work. They wrestled, she ripped and tore and clawed at him, bit holes in his helmet. Wow, she's got to have some tough teeth. And that too failed him for the first time in years of being worn to war. It would earn no glory. It was the last time anyone would wear it. Last time? Oh no. But Beowulf longed only for fame. Well, that's kind of a jerk. He's not doing this to help out those poor Danes. He just wants glory? What kind of hero is that? Oh, I guess that's how those geats were. Longed only for fame, leaped back into battle. He's not giving up. He tossed his sword aside. Angry, the steel edge blade lay where he dropped it. If weapons were useless, he'd use his hands, the strength in his fingers. So fame comes to the men who mean to win it and care about nothing else. He raised his arms and seized her by the shoulder. Anger doubled his strength. <coughs> Excuse me. He threw her to the floor. She fell. Grendel's fierce mother and the Geat's proud prince that's Beowulf again, was ready to leap on her. But she rose at once and repaid him with her clutching claws wildly tearing at him. <coughs> he, 
He was weary, that best and strongest of soldiers. His feet stumbled, and in an instant she had him down, held helpless. Squatting with her weight on his stomach, she drew a dagger, brown and dried with blood, and prepared to avenge her only son. But he was stretched on his back, and her stabbing blade was blunted by the woven mail shirt he wore on his chest. Oh, thank goodness he's still wearing his mail shirt. The hammered links held. The point could not touch him. He'd have traveled to the bottom of the earth. Ooh. He'd have traveled to the bottom of the earth, meaning he would have been dead if he wasn't wearing his chain mail. I'd get those, son. That's bad and died there if that shining woven metal had not helped and holy god who'd sent him victory gave judgment for truth and right ruler of the heavens once beowulf was back on his feet and fighting another christian reference then and alluding to the fact that beowulf is righteous and he's been chosen by god to win this battle so i think we have done all of these. She-Wolf, that's Grendel's mother, her guest, referring to Beowulf being a guest there. Runting is um, the sword that Beowulf is using. Geet's Proud Prince, that is Beowulf. And Edgetho's son, that's Beowulf as well. All right. So, um, here when he had decided to fight with his bare hands and throw his sword out, and he had done that with Grendel too. Think about who removed their armor before going to battle and returned victorious with the head of his opponent and a sword. Well, King David fighting Goliath. So you kind of wonder as you're reading some of these older stories, when they heard the Bible stories, did they kind of take little pieces, almost plagiarize them, but then shift them enough and weave them into their stories because they really like them? Interesting thought. <clears throat> then he saw, hanging on the wall, a heavy sword hammered by giants, strong and blessed with their magic, the best of all weapons, but so massive that no ordinary man could lift its carved and decorated length. He drew it from its scabbard, broke the chain on its hilt, and then Savage, now angry and desperate, lifted it high over his head and struck with all the strength he had left. Caught her in the neck and cut it through broke bones and all. Her body fell to the floor, lifeless. The sword was wet with her blood, and Beowulf rejoiced at the sight. Oh, wait a second. So Beowulf was using runting, this special sword, and that had no effect on her. And then he sees this sword on the wall, this giant sword, and he grabs that, and that one can cut off her head? Why would somebody keep around a sword that can cut off their own head. Does she not know that that sword had the power to cut off her head? Okay, so pay attention to what happens in um, these next lines here. <clears throat> the brilliant light shone suddenly as though burning in that hall and as bright as heaven's own candle lit the sky. He looked at her home, then following along the wall, went walking, his hands tight on the sword, his heart still angry. He was hunting another dead monster and took his weapon with him for final revenge against Grendel's vicious attacks. His nightmare raids over and over, coming to Herat when Hrothgar's men slept, killing them in their beds, eating some on the spot, 15 or more, and running to his loathsome moor with another such sickening meal waiting in his pouch. But Beowulf repaid him for those visits, found him lying dead in his corner, armless, exactly as that fierce fart fighter had sent him out from Herat, then struck off his head with a single swift blow. The body jerked for the last time, then lay still. So Beowulf finds uh, Grendel's dead body, cuts the head off, Who wants some revenge. The wise old warriors who surrounded Hrothgar 
like him staring into the monster's lake, saw the waves surging and blood spurting through. Okay, so Rothgar's men, that's the Danes, are standing around the lake. They're watching to see what's happening, and they see blood come up. They spoke about Beowulf, all the graybeards, whispered together, and said that hope was gone, that the hero had lost fame and his life at once, and would never return to the living come back as triumphant as he had left. We know that Beowulf's okay. They don't know, and they think he's dead. That's dramatic irony. Almost all agreed that Grendel's mighty mother, the she-wolf, had killed him. The sun slid over past noon, went further down. The Danes gave up, left the lake and went home, Rothgar with them. The Geats stayed, sat sadly, watching, imagining they saw their Lord, but not believing they would ever see him again. There's kind of a parallel there. Think about the disciples when Jesus died. And they had heard his words, didn't really understand them. And they thought um, they'd never see him again, but yet they went to that upper room and they stayed there waiting, hoping the Geats are kind of like Jesus' disciples. Then the sword melted, blood soaked, dripping down like water disappearing like ice when the world's eternal lord loosens invisible fetters and unwinds icicles and frost as only he can he who rules time and seasons he who is truly god well that's weird we kind of we were with beowulf chopping off grendel's head and then we went to the people who are standing outside around the lake and then the sword melts and disappears like ice melts in spring when God warms up the earth again. And there's a reference to believing in God and only he can rule time and seasons. Huh. So now we're back with Beowulf in the monster's lair. The monster's hall was full of rich treasures, but all that Beowulf took was Grendel's head and the hilt of the giant's jeweled sword. Well, at least the hilt didn't melt. The rest of that ring-marked blade had dissolved in Grendel's steaming blood. Ooh, that's kind of weird. So Grendel's blood melted the blade? Boiling even after his death. Was that because he was so angry? And then the battle's only survivor. That's a kenning. That's Beowulf. He's the only survivor. Swam up and away from those silent corpses. Hey, I wonder how long it took him to swim up. It took him like half a day to swim down. The water was calm and clean. The whole huge lake peaceful. Once the demons who lived in it were dead. Wait, does that mean like... All the sea monsters magically died at the same time that Grendel's mom died? Was there some kind of connection? Like, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, when they kill Sauron, like, well, they destroy the ring and Sauron goes poof, and then all those other guys go poof too? Is it just like that? Whoa. Um, just a little side note, early Christian leaders were really trying to get rid of pagan influences, including this legend of Beowulf. Oh, I guess we shouldn't be reading it in a Lutheran school. Anyway, Alcuin was this scholar and monk, and he worked for Charlemagne, and he created this system of universal education, like everybody goes to school, and they have to take this class and this class and this class. Required courses for graduation back in, you know, 700s. And he criticized the English bishop, 1797, for allowing Christian priests to listen to poetry similar to Beowulf while dining. 
arguing that Holy Scripture should be read instead. What were they thinking? Do you have do's and don'ts for dining together as a family in your home? Like you uh, shouldn't have your phone at the table or anything like that? Okay, let's see how this part wraps up. Then that noble protector of all seamen swam to land. Noble protector of all seamen. That's kind of a long Kenny, but that's Beowulf. Rejoicing in the heavy burdens he was bringing with him. <laughs> I've got a broken sword. I've got Grendel's head. Yeah. He and all his glorious band of geats thank God that their leader had come back unharmed. Yes. They left the lake together. The geats carried Beowulf's helmet and his mail shirt. Behind them, the water slowly thickened as the monster's blood came seeping up. Oh, good thing Beowulf got out of there when he did. Yuck. They walked quickly, happily, across roads all of them remembered, left the lake and the cliffs alongside it, brave men staggering under the weight of Grendel's skull, too heavy for fewer than four of them to handle. Boy, that kind of reminds me of, you know, not just Goliath, but also when Joshua and Caleb did that exploring in the land of Cana, and uh, they had to have so many men carry the bunch of grapes, you know, heavy stuff. That's, that's good storytelling material. Okay, so four of them carrying it. <clears throat> Two on each side of the spear jammed through it, yet proud of their ugly load and determined that the Danes, seated in Herat, should see it. Hey guys, let's lug this head up to Herat. We gotta make sure we show those Danes our, our bounty here. Soon, fourteen geats arrived at the hall, bold and warlike, and with Beowulf, their lord and leader. They walked on the mead hall green. Then the geats brave prince, geats brave prince, that's Beowulf, entered Herat, covered with glory for the daring battles he had fought. He sought Hrothgar to salute him and show Grendel's head. Yeah, he just wants to boast again. He carried that terrible trophy by the hair, brought it straight to where the Danes sat drinking, the queen among them. It was a weird and wonderful sight, and the warriors stared. Good alliteration of W's there, right? Okay, so just kind of putting it in your own words, the Geats come marching back to Herat, and they're pretty happy, and they're pleased with themselves. They're bringing Grendel's head. They plop it down in front of the Danes, in front of Hrothgar, and note that they drop it in front of the queen, too. Interesting. Does she play any kind of a role in this? Is this kind of like, huh, look at me. Is there some kind of love story going on between Beowulf and the queen? Because Rothgar couldn't get rid of the monster? And does it have anything to do with the fact that maybe Grendel was Rothgar's illegitimate son? Anyway, that's just wondering about things. That's not really here. But something was going on, that's for sure. So, one sentence summary, and we are on to the last battle. Oh no, that means we're almost done with Beowulf. I wonder if this is a good time to pause. Well, maybe I will.